Greetings. Bonjour. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am N.Y. Nathiri, Executive Director of the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community Incorporated. We are known as PEC. On behalf of the Association's Board of Directors, I bring you warm, warm welcome to this sequel to the 2020 inaugural Africa America Women's Economic Forum and Trade Expo. Today we are in for a real treat. We are all excited about the ability to bring this forum, Women Empowered for Economic Revival, Beyond the Pandemic and Injustice. Today's program will feature distinguished women in their fields, women who will bring to us a message of encouragement, of engagement, and of how to move forward. I want to uh, thank the good, good work of my co-convener, Sister ZNZ Dillon of the Door of Our Return Foundation. As we go through today's program, I'm hoping that you will catch the spirit, that there will be ways that we can identify for practical, for pragmatic uh, paths to build collaboration and network. Thank you so much for all of you who are up bright and early with us, and uh, we proceed now with our program. Okay, I did. All right, go. Good morning. Good morning, bonjour. My name is Marie-Josée Francois, board member of Preserve Itonville Community in uh, immediate past chair of the board of PEC. Welcome to the Women Empowerment for Economic Revival Beyond the Pandemic and Injustice. We begin. I'm sorry. <laughs> we begin 2021 with immense gratitude. Last year at this time, we never imagined the challenges we will face with a global uh, pandemic. Despite the ongoing pandemic, we began this year with hope and even more excitement about the future. So for me, this conference, building stronger relationships and sustainable economic bridges between Africa and America as women in government, businesses, community leaders, we bring connection togetherness to do the best we can do. Enjoy the day, share your knowledge, wishing you the best during those eight hours of sharing. And also the most important part, thank you for your commitment to PEC. Thank you for your long standing collaboration with Preserve Etonville Community. Thank you. Hello, I'm Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second annual African American Women's Economic Forum, Women Empowered for Economic Revival Beyond the Pandemic and Injustice. As we continue to navigate these challenging times, I applaud the organizers for bringing this timely forum 
to participants on a global scale. During the forum, I hope you have the opportunity to network and foster relationships as you continue to build your business network. Minority and women-owned businesses are integral to our economy and our community. Within Orange County government, we are proud to support our minority and women-owned businesses through the Orange County Business Development Division. The management team is focused on providing resources that stimulates economic growth for small businesses and minority and women-owned businesses. Last year, Orange County awarded $46 million in contracts to minority and women-owned businesses. In addition, the Orange County Federal CARES Act provided over $67 million in grants to small businesses with 65% of those being minority and women-owned. As our economy slowly rebounds, I am optimistic that women and minority-owned businesses will help accelerate our economic recovery efforts. It is my mission to create a community that embraces innovation, collaboration, and inclusion and cultivates economic development opportunities for all communities. Thank you, and I wish you all the very best for a successful event. United Cities and Local Governments for Africa is the umbrella organization and united voice and representatives of local governments across the continent. UCLG Africa supports its members through research, knowledge sharing, training and capacity building delivered through its pilot initiatives and flagship projects. We had all key stakeholders, the farmers, the business people, the universities, civil society organizations, trade union, all of them coming at our cities to, to, to take advantage of this platform to try and give flesh to what we call Agenda 2063. We were treated in uh, 10 years ago as nobody. Now we are on the map and nobody can dare a talking development without talking to local governments. United cities of Africa Calling for peace in Africa Light up the way for Africa God bless us all in Africa United Good morning, good evening Wherever you are, we welcome you to our second Africa America Women Economic Forum. I am uh, Zinzi Dillon. I'm here as uh, the co curator for this amazing forum. I want to say to my brothers and sisters who are out there come, joining us from the continent, a big welcome to you, my brothers and sisters across uh, the US. Welcome. I'm here to introduce to you. Um, Dr. Mbasi, uh, who is uh, the Secretary General for the United Cities and Local Governments of uh, Africa. We got to meet uh, Dr. Mbasi with, uh, with uh, my sister N.Y. Nathiri, who is the Executive Director and Co-Curator for this uh, forum at uh, the United Cities and Local Governments uh, of Africa Summit, which is called the Afri, Afri Cities. It is a huge organization. It is an association of mayors across the whole continent. The Afri City Summit is held every three years and uh, the attendance, it gets to about 5,000 people, government ministers, mayors, uh, state governors. Uh, at uh, the cities, uh, Afri City Summit uh, in Morocco, we took a small delegation as part of the door of our return of elected officials and that's where we met uh, with uh, NY, and uh, that was really the beginning of uh, incubating uh, and uh, coming up with uh, what we have today. So it is my honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Mbasi, Secretary General for the United Cities and Local Governments of Africa.
Thank you, Cindy. I don't know if I have the floor. Yes, you have, yeah. Ah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important gathering of the African-American Women Economic Forum held in the framework of the Zora Festival 2021. I am speaking here on behalf of the 16,000 African subnational and local governments uh, of the continent. And uh, we are all gathered within the umbrella organization of our <coughs> of local government, which is called the United Cities and Local Government of Africa. And you have uh, a piece of uh, the anthem of uh, our organization of there. And uh, we are headquartered in uh, Rabat in Morocco. And uh, we really want to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy 2021 new year. I'm also happy uh, to uh, congratulate you for the election of Camilla Harris at the White House as Vice President. We are proud of her and we wish her every success in her new duty. I am here to express how thirsty Africa is of her diaspora. As you might know, the African Union, our political umbrella organization on the continent, has defined the diaspora as the sixth region of the continent, besides the North Africa region, the West Africa region, the Central Africa region, the East Africa region, and the Southern Africa region. In each of these regions, we have established a regional economic community to care about the contribution of the region to the development of Africa. I think it is just time to establish the, kind, the same kind of uh, institution for the diaspora as the sixth region of Africa. Of course, uh, uh, I wish that this forum takes up this challenge to establish the Diaspora Regional Economic Community. And I think I'm at the right place addressing the right people. Since uh, if you listen to the African wisdom, the wants of women are the ones of God. The African American Women Economic Forum is surely the right audience to table this proposal because I'm sure that if you mobilize yourself for this cause, it will happen sooner than later. And you have a series of uh, opportunities to do so. The number one opportunity is, uh, of course, uh, the Africity Summit. This Africity Summit, uh, as it was uh, recalled by, the, by Zinzi, uh, is uh, uh, a huge gathering of decision makers at the local and national government, dealing with uh, the local governance and local governments and the contribution in the Africa's development and in the Africa's unity. The next one will be held in the city of Kisumu, is an intermediary city in, in, the, in Kenya, in April 2022. In Kisumu, we will organize an Africities Investment Forum, where we want that all the business people, in particular the business from the diaspora, come and share with the, the business in the continent how best they can participate in the development of the continent, uh, given the fact that they are welcomed by the local governments. 
Those who attended with us uh, the uh, celebration of the door of our return, remember how much mayors on the continent want to welcome the diaspora, not only for cultural reasons, but also for business. Because many people are pouring into Africa. You take the European, you take the Chinese, you, you, you take uh, uh, many of us. And what we want to, 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 test, to, to, to testify here is that we, we want uh, the African-American to be among the most important investors on the Moveland. And uh, I'm talking to women. I know that the determination of women transform any, any project into the reality. So please, come at the Africities Investment Forum and provide your knowledge to your mobile app because it is very critical that we start building uh, our uh, mobile land and uh, we stop agonizing. Uh, it is time to strategize how we are going to get out of the mess that uh, uh, the history has put uh, Africa. And I want you also to appreciate that maybe uh, you are, people are scared of coming to Africa because the narrative on Africa uh, is quite negative. We uh, endeavor to uh, balance this narrative. This is why we created, uh, with the support of UNESCO, a world of uh, African and Afro descendant culture. This day was celebrated on the 24th of uh, January. And every 24th of January, uh, you should be part of this celebration so that we rebuild our self esteem and we reconnect with the history of the continent. I really wish that. Uh, my proposal of your mobilization, including through the creation of the diaspora regional economic community, falls into your hands and that you take it up as the American, the African American uh, economic, uh, women economic forum. We we want you to be part of us. And I'm sure that if you have that will, Africa will uh, go towards a process of renaissance. I thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mbasi, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I always uh, like. Uh, engaging with uh, Dr. Mbasi because he's very pragmatic and very practical. Uh, so the issue that he has left us with, uh, the diaspora regional economic uh, community, uh, from a women's perspective, we believe that uh, we are the right leaders for it because we have already started uh, doing some work connecting the Africa with the American uh, uh, women, so so we can uh, establish uh, sustainable economic uh, uh, co collaborations and partnerships. So uh, it is my honor. Um, before I move on, I just want to uh, acknowledge and uh, honor uh, Dr. Mbasi for his support for women. We were in uh, Morocco. Uh, there was. Um, a mayor, uh, the mayor of uh, a small city in, um, in Gabon. She was sitting right in front of me. Uh, before the end of uh, the summit, 
the same mayor was uh, the president of uh, the United Cities and local governments of Africa. And it was all because of the support of uh, Dr. Mbasi. But that did not go that far. It went even further. Uh, she became, when she went back to her home country, the home country actually realized the potential that uh, she had. So Dr. Mbasi enabled the unveiling of the talent in a woman. She believed that a woman could lead United Cities and local governments of Africa. Uh, the, the country, uh, Gabon, they appointed a, a year after as uh, the government minister. As we talk today, uh, two years after that, she became the head of uh, the state. So she is the prime minister of Gabon. So Dr. Mbasi, we salute you as women. Thank you for supporting us, for unveiling the potential within uh, women. So we, we acknowledge you for that. Uh, so today uh, we have a very interesting program. Uh, it is a conversation where we are going to actually look at uh, how uh, are we as women going, going to understand um, the, to have insights in terms of what is going on. We cannot have solutions without us understanding the key issues. And the key issues that we are currently facing is uh, COVID. The, we, have, we are in the midst of COVID. Some of us probably towards the tail end. We don't know where it is going to end. But all we know is uh, there have been lots of disruptions. People are talking about the new norm. What does that new norm mean to us as women? How are we going to trade between one another? How are we going to sustain those uh, trade relationships? How are we going to further stick together, connect in a sustainable way? What are the key opportunities that we are seeing in the midst of all these disruptions? Uh, we look at uh, the global supply chains, they have been disrupted. What are the opportunities that we have uh, uh, between Africa and America? So today we will have um, conversations. Uh, we will have uh, uh, sessions that we are going to follow through. I'm just going to walk you through those sessions. The first panel uh, dialogue or discussion is going to be on sustainable trade and access to, to markets. How do we create access to markets? And how do we start collaborating for sustainable trade. Then secondly, we are going to go into building partnerships and networks that is going to start at 9.35 to uh, 10.35. After that, we are going to have um, a dialogue on uh, how do we start uh, developing entrepreneurs. So that is going to be entrepreneurial development. And that panel is going to be uh, laid by um, my, my uh, sister, uh, Pamela McCauley. Then after that, uh, the last uh, panel is going to start at uh, 12.05 EST time, uh, which is uh, probably about uh, nine o'clock, no, seven o'clock uh, Central Africa time. So that's going to be a panel on digital economy. Digital economy is a huge, huge uh, economy that we need to understand and uh, how do we come up with uh, solutions? How do we come up, uh, how do we understand opportunities and how do we collaborate as uh, women? So our program, we're going to end at uh, 145. There will be some uh, breaks in between. You will get to hear some music. So if you can try to dance uh, ju or just uh, sync in uh, with the with the with the with the music. So I'm I'm going to introduce the first panel. The first panel is uh, the sustainable trade and access to markets. Uh, I'm going to introduce my sister uh, Angela Lusiki, who is uh, the resident representative for the United Nations uh, Development Program (UNDP) in Ghana. Uh, my sister, welcome. Right, uh, we have um, Sherry Sherini, uh, who is also a sister. She's the managing director for Mikana Inc. and also chairperson of Cassava uh, Smart Tech Group. Uh, Shelly, welcome. I don't see you. Are you online? Oh, yes. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 
So um, I'm going to quickly just uh, uh, hand over to uh, Shelly. Uh, Shelly, um, sustainable trade uh, and access to markets. What are your thoughts? Just a few remarks. Um, and then after we'll get to hear from Angela. Over to uh, you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Zienzile. And um, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, my apologies, we, we struggled with network to connect. It's unusual though, because our network services is usually very good, but my apologies. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Mbasi, for supporting women. Uh, you are one of a kind. Uh, let me say you are an endangered species. So we would like to preserve you very much so that you can continue to support women. Uh, when I'm looking at sustainable trade um, and the opportunities that exist for women in particular and for business in general in Africa and uh, especially with uh, other business people from beyond our continent, um, the opportunities that I'm going to highlight today are not necessarily to do with the traditional uh, you know, type of opportunities like in uh, the mining, uh, the big uh, kind of like uh, what are considered big sectors. But within those sectors, where do the opportunities lie? Within those big sectors that we find Africa is endowed with resources, where do the opportunities lie? In mining, where do the opportunities lie? Uh, I'm not talking about actually owning a mine, although that, um, uh, there is no hindrance to that, but I, I don't want my focus to be that. And um, in the agricultural sector, where are the opportunities? Again, I'm not talking about planting agricultural product or getting involved into livestock and so forth. That still is very good, but I want to take a slightly different approach to highlight opportunities to African-American women uh, of areas where we are not playing a role and yet there are huge opportunities. Uh, I will be compiling a lot of data to share with Dr. Zienzile later uh, because I couldn't get as much of the data that as I needed. So I got hold of uh, a little bit um, of the data. But um, the opportunities that I'm going to focus on are really within the supply chains of existing companies. Uh, and through that, there will be other greenfield opportunities that uh, provide op uh, opportunities for entering into businesses and into partnership. But within the supply chain framework of, especially of established companies, the advantage that you find is that there is a bit of a low barriers to entry. Whereas if you get into the traditional uh, mining and so forth, there is quite a lot of barriers to entry, uh, not least of which are the licensing requirements and the very huge things that uh, you have to pay. So if you, want, if you want to avoid that, but still have a foot within those industries, what can you do? The best thing that, um, 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 any entrepreneur looking for those uh, for business opportunities would do would be to look into adding value upstream or downstream existing companies. Just to make it a little clearer in the short space of time that I have, I'll give you an example. Around um, 2010 or thereabout, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation together with another organization partnered with the Coca-Cola company in a project in Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya to provide support to uh, communal farmers to grow mangoes, papaya, and uh, passion fruit as a supply to the juice making um, company, the juice making arm of the Coca-Cola company. They in the company, the Coca-Cola company was saying we are importing in East Africa, they were importing their juices from either India or from South Africa. Uh, but the opportunities to do those mango varieties existed within their countries. So there was one organization willing to provide uh, what you may call the community support 
by helping farmers to be self-sustainable through uh, the planting of fruit. But when they planted their fruit, much of what we find in Africa is that that fruit goes to waste and it rots and uh, they don't get the true value of the labor that they put into it. That's why they remain poor, but they're doing a lot. The uh, value was in talking to the, uh, to the user of the fruit and say, if you set up a juice producing plant, we will ensure that you get, your pipeline will be supported through fruit coming from these farmers. And so the discussions will then be around um, uh, critical mass and all those other things, the pricing discussions and so forth and so forth. But the critical point is that you are part of a supply, ch supply chain into something that somebody is already doing. There are huge opportunities in that. I'll give you another example. Uh, the East Africa Gazette, um, East Africa Community Gazette at some point looked into its um, uh, region and they found out that uh, there were 77, I think this was around 2016, there were 77 companies importing over 384,000 tons, uh, thousand metric tons of sugar. And uh, this is high quality white refined sugar, which is used uh, in confectionery, in beverages, in many other uses, including in, in pharmaceuticals to a certain extent. So uh, the, the opportunity here in lies in the fact that that sugar was not refined in the region. And the advantage of now working at a regional level and uh, maybe setting up a, a sugar refining plant within a region or being the arm that actually mobilizes the importation of sugar for all these companies and doing it on behalf of the region is such that when you're working within a region, the region is almost like a one big country. There is a lot of overcoming of a um, lot of barriers from one country to another because the regional blocks also offer good opportunities. The other third example, the last example that I will give is in Nigeria. Nigeria doesn't grow wheat. Uh, they import their wheat as they make bread and other um, um, confectionery items that use flour. But uh, they found out that cassava was a good substitute. And this was driven more by the president of the Africa Development Bank, uh, Dr. Adichina. So they then started to grow cassava and to have a blend of cassava and wheat so that they reduce over time the importation of wheat while they increase the uh, use of cassava and growing the right variety that would produce the bread that is needed and uh, combine it with wheat in order to produce the right quality of flour that is useful for confectionery production. The other example would be around sweeteners as well. You know, the sweeteners that are used in non-sugary items. Uh, there's huge opportunities in that in looking at sweetener sub substitutes. Uh, some of them would be plants that are grown within Africa, uh, but the processing and manufacture of that is what I'm more talking about. So the opportunities lie in people coming together. These are huge opportunities. So as an individual, it will take a lot. But if people, if women can get together, collaborate together, form a company, do your due diligence, identify the opportunities, approach the region, approach um, supporters like uh, the president of the African Development Bank, it's very possible that we, we, women could be part of the supply chain of big entities of major companies. So there are huge opportunities along supply chains. There are also huge opportunities within the services sector. You know, a lot of the uh, companies that have um, uh, succeeded uh, internationally, part of their success lies in ways of doing business that are efficient. There are huge opportunities for partnering 
rather than just the value chain aspect that I've talked about, like in the agricultural sector or even in the mining sector, supply of components, supply of chilling equipment, for example, supply of blasting equipment, but not so much the full equipment, but the components that are required to that are required by the mining industry to um, to repair or the accessories that are required is they use whatever they use to blast or to refine or to uh, the chemicals that they use. The huge opportunities in packaging, huge opportunities in labels, huge opportunities in preforms because one-way packaging has become quite a big thing and the African population is growing. So the supplier localization provides a lot of opportunities. And you may not know the, the opportunities may not necessarily be the African American partnership actually delivering that product, but setting up a center of expertise that works with the local people, the local women and drives them. And then you now are giving the technical support. You are giving the technical, you are the arm that bridges uh, what the locals need and what those that are offshore can supply. All those are areas of value chain addition. But in addition to that, things like brand development, there's quite a lot that needs to be done. Now things are moving much, much faster than it used to happen before and a lot cheaper, especially with digitalization and, and technology. So brand uh, development is still a huge gaping area for even small companies, but if pulling together and saying, here is what we do, it's, it's almost like cooperative, but I'm using the word cooperative loosely more as an adjective than the actual uh, nuts and bolts of cooperatives because I don't quite believe so much in them, uh, but I'm using it loosely. Those opportunities where we pull together, we collaborate, we become our partners around things that we can join dots together so that we create a one-stop shop for any entrepreneur within the country to access those resources. Uh, opportunities around, say, smoothening the licensing requirements of what companies do. What you find mostly in Africa, which is very inefficient, is that licensing uh, authorities are distributed all over the town. So for you to move from one license to the other, you are you have one licensing authority to the other, it's a waste of time. But we can create synergies for efficiency maximization. Uh, those are gaping opportunities again, which require a certain technical expertise. And it's not expensive expertise for that matter, but things that reduce cost so that somebody does for them to get all the licenses that they require for business. They don't have to travel 100 kilometers within one city simply because the entities built by government are distributed all over. There is no business thinking of creating one-stop shops. So portfolio expansion, just helping companies to broaden their scope of, post, of, of portfolios, that think uh, thought leadership and that think tank, there's huge opportunities for that. It's an area that I'm particularly very fond of because um, many companies, including big companies, are losing value through that. So there's a lot of opportunities, silent opportunities that is uncontested so much by the political space because they don't know very much about it. The area where like the mining licenses and so forth, that one has too much barriers to entry and also political interference. But these other areas are so value adding, so, so much value that, that is lying uh, untaped. And um, I think um, I'll end here and open up for, um, for questions and uh, hand over to Dr. Zinzi. But all I want to emphasize is that within the services sector, there are huge opportunities for human capital development, for example, for communication, because a lot of what we are doing now requires communication through this media and so forth. And then the value chains of the traditional sectors, your agricultural sector, food services,
uh, supplying agricultural services, being the one that supplies maybe the bowls that the uh, agricultural industry needs for its uh, tractors and for whatever it needs. This is an area where also, uh, for example, if I give the example of Zimbabwe, where farmers were driven off the land, a lot of them don't regret it now because farming services has become a major business which is not even vulnerable to the elements of the weather. You continue to provide farming services to whatever crop is happening around that time. So these are some of the uh, opportunities that are lying uh, waste that are lying gaping and are waiting to be tapped. And the focus for women is actually now, the, if we don't tap into that, uh, the women's story will become um, a, a long played record, a, a, a boring record. Uh, so uh, I think I'll end there. Uh, it's an area that I'm passionate about and I can go on and on, but I'll love we, to we open can. up. We can feel your passion, uh, Sherry. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think you touched mm -hmm. on a number of uh, interesting uh, areas, including agriculture services. Uh, we will be visiting uh, those areas in terms of what is it that we can really focus on uh, in, on this panel and uh, how can we follow up on that. Uh, I'm going to move over to Angela. Angela, um, the African Continental Free uh, Trade Area Agreement. Uh, it is an agreement that was recently signed uh, by uh, heads of states, uh, different countries. Uh, once it is fully implemented, it is going to create the largest uh, free trade area uh, across the world measured uh, in terms of number of participating countries. There are about 55 participating countries um, that will be within that uh, free trade area, uh, linking about 1.3 billion uh, African people across the continent. And this is excluding the Africa diaspora. And I would like to highlight that the Africa diaspora, it has been recognized by the African Union as uh, the uh, sixth regional economic block. So, those who are here on the continent or in, in America who came, uh, you know, our ancestors, they came through the slave trade route. I want you to, to highlight trade. The reason why they came here, it was not for social programs, it was for trade. So that's why we are talking about sustainable trade today. How do we reverse what was, what was done? And they came to do agriculture. Uh, they were in, um, you know, in, in the South. The South was known as uh, the cotton king. Uh, it was the fourth largest economy across the, con across the world. So everyone who was coming uh, in terms of uh, those who were looking for uh, opportunities, it was about cotton, but at the expense of um, our, 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 our fathers, our mothers, that is gone. Now we are now, uh, it is still lingering because there, there are discussions on reparations. Uh, part of the Zora Festival, there was a community conversation on reparations, which is about, uh, a, it's a price tag of close to about, uh, probably about 12 million, if I, if I recall the numbers, 12 million, million tr uh, in, I mean trillions, that's, that's, uh, those, that's the reparation uh, tag. But that's not the conversation today. The conversation today is how do we leverage the opportunities that are being presented by the Africa trade area, the, the whole Africa trade area with a 3.4 trillion market? How do we start leveraging on that? How do we start organizing ourselves as women here in, the, in, Africa, in, in Africa, across the US? How do we start working together? in a sustainable way. So that's question number one. Question number two for you, you are the UNDP head of um, Ghana. You are in charge of Ghana, right? Ghana is very key. Uh, the door of our return, uh, which, were, which is led by Reverend Dennis Dillon, there was a group that went uh, to Africa as part of the 400 years, started off in Ghana, met with uh, the president of Ghana, heads of states, uh, some uh, 
captains of industry left, went to Senegal, uh, met with uh, Dr. Mbasi for the symbolic opening of the door because our ancestors left through the door of no return. So there was a symbolic uh, ceremony to open the door and not opening the door just for people to come. Yes, it's great. It's connecting for commerce, but it is it's connecting for culture, but it's also connecting for commerce, which is why we are having this conversation. So I am saying to you, uh, you are in Ghana. Ghana, it is so key when it comes to cocoa production. Ghana produces the the second largest worldwide cocoa, right? They produce, they are the second producers of cocoa. When it comes to harvesting cocoa, we don't see a lot of local people. We see a lot of those who came to, to actually do the slave trade. They're the same people who are hovering around uh, over, over, over Ghana you know, to try and get the cocoa. And where is the cocoa being taken to? It is going into Switzerland. And, uh, you know, the big manufacturers of chocolate. And I've always said, Switzerland has got no chocolates without cocoa. So how do we start having conversations with the likes of Lindt? I love Lindt chocolate. How do we start having those conversations with Lindt to say, how about having local manufacturing hubs for lint, but actually connecting with uh, women? How do we start uh, tapping into the whole value chain? So I'm going to leave that uh, question to you as part of your opening remarks. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dylan, and, and thank you very much for having me as part of this forum. It, it's such a pleasure to join this discussion. And you've raised a lot of important issues. And one thing I just want to start with is that we come up with a lot of plans. We come up with a lot of agreements. But in the case of the Africa continental free trade area, I'm happy to report that those long discussions that started in 2018 have now moved into the action phase. So on the 1st of January 2021, it was a huge ceremony. And we witnessed history because we have now started trading under the Africa continental free trade area. And Ghana was one of the first countries, I know they flagged off uh, one of their first shipments to South Africa under these new rules. And why is it important? And what does it mean for, for trade within the continent? I think the most important thing to highlight is that we, for too long we've been chained to an extractive um, type of relationship with our global trading partners, where we export, as you said, raw cocoa, uh, extractives and we and commodities basically that are unprocessed while we had very little trade with our neighbors and those are shorter shorter supply chains that create more opportunities for entrepreneurs within countries so with this uh, africa continental free trade area we are opening up that space to trade with each other removing the tariff barriers to create opportunities for industrialization to take hold um, and to have the sort of industries that create jobs and we know we, it's estimated by 2035 if we increase the level of trade and industrialization within the continent, we'll be able to lift 100 million people out of poverty. And not just that, it means that we'll be more competitive so that the products that we are able to produce on the continent, we're able to create value and retain a lot more value so that we are in a much more competitive space to trade with the rest of the world. So the Africa continental free trade area for me is a huge opportunity. And, and as Cherie mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities and low hanging fruit for women to engage in value chains. But imagine if you could go beyond your borders to your neighbors. It even creates more opportunities and, uh, and, and space to have um, relationships along those routes. I think for me, from a development perspective, when it comes to the African continental free trade area, it is also creating opportunities for smaller enterprises. Because in the past, the traders, um, and as mentioned also by Cherie, it's been captured by the big industry players. But now we're creating opportunities for smaller uh, entrepreneurs in various industries. We've talked about agriculture and agribusiness is very big, but there are other areas like tourism, she mentioned services, but also the creative sector and the arts. 
And I believe that the creative industry is one of the biggest uh, and fastest growing areas um, within Africa that has the opportunity to create jobs for a lot of young people who are already engaged and, and to be able to create the value and capture the, the, that value by being part of the creation and not just consumption. So I really see the Africa continental free trade area as an opportunity to shift and transform power relations and opportunities for smaller entrepreneurs. And this is also an, an important investment opportunity for people who want to come and partner and invest in startups and invest in, in the growing opportunities that we have on the continent. Sometimes it's a matter of financing. Uh, a lot of times it's also a matter of skills. It's also a matter of, um, you know, ways of doing business. And really there, there are significant opportunities now to partner with, with emerging players and really to contribute to the Made in Africa brand because the stronger the brand, uh, the easier it will be to link these, these, these brands to global markets. You mentioned the, the area of, of cocoa production. What is happening now is that we find that the farmers are getting the short end of the stick. They're not able to actually access uh, a lot of va the value that's being created out of the continent. By having more trade flows within the continent, then you create more opportunities to have uh, these products uh, manufactured on the continent. Another example also is around shea butter. I just came up from the north and I met with some women who were going through a very laborious process trying to even extract the shea butter. And we know that, that is, it's, almost, it's almost gold once it leaves the continent. So how do we look for opportunities and invest in entrepreneurs who are willing to carry out the processing within the continent? And by having access to more markets within the continent that are more accessible, you can see that there are opportunities really to drive that kind of transformation. Thank you, Zinzi. Wow, thank you very much. Um, you touched on uh, some very interesting uh, areas. Uh, let's start off with uh, the shea butter. But before we go to the shea butter, let's just go back to Sherry. Sherry, uh, you raised a value um, chain addition uh, within the food uh, services. Um, my sister Angela also touched on a bit on that. Um, where, where do we start? What, what is that one big opportunity that uh, we can follow through? Uh, the reason why I'm asking this question, we do have a number of big uh, US companies that are doing business on the continent. How do we start following those big companies into the US, right, as women? and then connect with the local women in whatever country they are doing business and uh, come up with uh, maybe value chain addition uh, or manufacturing of components. For example, it could be maybe Microsoft, uh, the CEO for Microsoft South Africa. She's going to join us a bit later. Uh, Microsoft South Africa, they are there they are doing business, but they also they are also supplying. They are also procuring services. How do we start having those conversations? Coca Cola is here in the U.S. How do we start following Coca Cola even on just manufacturing the lids or the bottles? Where do we start? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zinzi. Uh, the very first thing is for people to do their due diligence uh, mm -hmm. around certain areas of opportunity. So let me take beverages, for example. Uh, you target a company and you say this company has a global reach or a continental reach. Do your due diligence, uh, find out which specific area. Um, I, I, I'm more familiar with the beverage industry having been part of the Coca-Cola system. Uh, so for example, in the beverage industry, both talking breweries as well as uh, soft drink beverages, the breweries, they are looking at um, uh, things like uh, um, uh, outgrower schemes, uh, those ones. Um, so you then uh, study that area that they are interested in, that they are outsourcing to someone so that they can focus on their core business. Look at all the components that constitute 
their import bill have the, then go to the big companies, especially for those that are in America. If you start at the top with a good value proposition, the CEOs of these companies listen. But if you, we, if you go to them almost like saying, now what are you doing? Can you help us? They don't have the time for that. And once you have had audience with them once, uh, to try and come back again with another proposition, then they are delegating you. And if there's nothing that is attracting their energy, even their resources will not follow. So the most important thing is to do due diligence. By doing due diligence is to find out what is the, com what is the company importing? What, where are the opportunities? Uh, talk to some people within the organization, listen to read their reports. Usually when they talk about sustainability, they do highlight the areas where they are lending sustainable, uh, what, which are areas of interest. The, the import substitution one, <clears throat> excuse me, remains a big one or in, um, supplier localization, let me put it that way. Supplier mm -hmm. localization remains a big one. Um, so you, looking at those opportunities and then once areas of value proposition, you are talking, you are showing knowledge, you then approach uh, the CEO of a company. Uh, you do your stakeholder mapping properly and then you approach with a good value proposition that will um, attract the attention of, of your audience of one or a couple. Right. Uh, it, um, it cascades. Right. Um, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, you, when you started, you highlighted that uh, there, there are fruits out there or maybe vegetables um, that are organically farmed, but because there is no market or access to markets, right? Mm -hmm. They are just going to the ground, going to waste. So there is yeah. wastage there. Yet yeah. uh, here in the US, if you go to a Korean shop or store, you find Korean uh, products there. How mm. do we start bringing African organic products on in into the US market? Um, the US government signed uh, the Prosper Africa strategy to, to, to try and bridge the gap between Africa and America from a trade perspective. But as women, we are the ones who are going to the stores to buy uh, groceries uh, and all that. We are buying from other people. Why don't we start now creating our own supply chains or even just say we are providing to this market. Uh, this is the market that we are providing to uh, these are the products we can start with dry products, or we can start even with a canning, canning of uh, mangoes. Uh, we, when we went to South Africa uh, at the Pan African Parliament, we had a number of uh, brothers and sisters from here. They tested the mangoes and they said, "We've never tested such sweet mangoes before mm -hmm. because they are organic." So where mm -hmm. do we start? Uh, it starts by identifying which areas grow which uh -huh. type of products. For example, I'm giving the um, um, uh, agricultural example. For mm -hmm. In the Eastern Highlands of Zimbabwe, for example, you have these banana plantations that are, uh, they, it's a banana growing area. Mm -hmm. uh, once that has happened, um, start by talking uh, before the product is actually at a stage when it needs to be shipped to market. Start by engaging the buyers of those at a more senior level, and mm -hmm. then linking them with a source of supply. The only downside would be, uh, we need to make sure that there's continuity of supply and that certain quality specifications are met, especially where it concerns agricultural produce and importation. Mm -hmm. uh, you see there's a lot of regulation in terms of bringing soil and other things that uh, insects and so forth that could be brought into the country. But it's first of all, looking at where is the demand? The demand mm. is around organic. Where is the supply of organic? What is it organic? Is organic what? Is it organic beef? Is it organic vegetable? Is it, and then bringing together a critical mass of suppliers of that organic produ produce. 
um, of course, their quality requirements and so forth, uh, uh, working together with um, a few people that are already doing what are in that sector who can mm -hmm. then mobilize their other partners, but you are working with subject matter experts. And it's very easy to mobilize once you, are, you have identified somebody like a woman or, a, or any, any individual, not necessarily a woman, who is working within that particular sector. The right. other area also is around components for cooling equipment. Uh, you know, the cooling companies can retain their intellectual property on the actual mechanism that supplies the, com the, the, cooling, uh, the cooling system. But there are many other components for assembly where instead of shipping a whole ready-made unit, you, we then set up a supplier assembly, a, a, an assembly plant. You mm -hmm. are receiving the components, you set up an assembly, even the duties become less because some things become not dutiable because it's a component that, is, that may not even exist in the tariff handbooks of companies. Right. Uh, or okay. if it does, it attracts a very low tariff. So right. that mm -hmm. way there is, uh, there is reduction uh, of cost. So it's, uh, you, you look at um, um, companies like beverage companies that have a huge network of cooling equipment and you say, okay, we will assembly, assemble for you within this um, market. And we are strategically positioned to then become the hub that supplies to a number of, a number of countries that are within a, a, a common region. So that again, the barriers to the trade are minimized if you are working within regional spaces. So right. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's how to approach it. It's really, looking at what are they doing, packaging, for example, shrink wrap, tons and tons of shrink wrap material uh, are used. Uh, who is supplying that? Much of it comes from India, China, those spaces. Mm -hmm. If we can localize the production of shrink wrap within a regional grouping and then supply from the region, that again work, works well. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah, so, so I think uh, you, you've touched some uh, key points that uh, we'll probably need to put on the table. Uh, let me go to uh, Dr. Angela. You touched on shea butter. When you said shea butter, I said, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a huge market uh, for shea butter here in the US. Uh, you touched on creative industries. Uh, the, what I have here, it was made uh, by a Ghanaian teller. Um, right, and there's a huge market for that or demand for that. Now, where do we start with uh, the creative industries? Uh, this is something practical. Um, how do we start? Uh, wh wh like Ghana, they've got beautiful material. Uh, they are good tailors there. So how do we start linking? Uh, with the US market. Thank you so much, Dr. Zinzi. And I just wanted to touch on your previous point to say yeah. that digital, you know, digital technology is completely opening up the space uh, for having access to some of these markets and, and opening up uh, linking demand to supply. Mm -hmm. And and just in a, I think I think the best kept secret in New York really is those African markets, because when you go to those African markets, you can find everything from Africa. But as, as uh, Cherie said, there's still a lot of barriers to be overcome. And mm -hmm. by looking at the digital space and e-commerce, you're actually also able to, you know, overcome a lot of issues around linking your demand to your supply. There are so many things that I was able to access on Amazon, which I was so surprised um, I could do. And that also opens up the space for smaller entrepreneurs who are just starting and able to market very specific things. So you don't have to go big. You know, you start somewhere, you create your supply chain and, and you're able to continue. But just about with the creative industry and with Share Butter as well, there are some intermediaries um, and there are people who are actually working on this um, on the continent. And I, I've met a lot of uh, enterprising young Ghanaians who are, you know, doing amazing work uh, in mm -hmm. the fashion industry mm -hmm. and across the continent. In fact, I invite um, those who, who maybe did not uh, see the, 
the, the first day of trading and the African Union, they, they put together a whole program and they had the creative industry, you know, showcasing some of the work that they're doing across the continent, connecting um, to each other. So definitely the creative industry is a very good entry point and there are organizations that are already set up to try and popularize, whether it's, um, you know, film, um, radio and so on and so forth. So there are people on the continent who are doing it. So it's a matter of getting in touch um, and, and creating opportunities to collaborate. I've seen some very good films that are collaborations between um, African-American uh, companies and a Ghanaian company, for instance, mm -hmm. that are really you know, transforming that space. And I'm happy to say that I don't think there's any, any country in Africa that doesn't have a growing film industry. And there's so much material and so many people that, that we can partner with in that area. And our organization is trying to look at what are the investable opportunities. So because we're looking at the SDGs as a whole, we try to look at what the government priorities are. We try also to look at district development um, priorities and try to identify what the investable opportunities are. And we come up with SDG business maps or SDG investment maps. So that is one of the tools that we're currently using in Ghana and in other countries as well to try and identify areas that investors can come into. Because you know sometimes it's a tall order to say, you need to come into renewable energy, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if the government is, is interested in for example, solar for health, and they want to see how they can expand, uh, you know, providing solar solar panels for schools and, and health centers and so on. We identify that as an investable opportunity and we, we draw the parameters and have um, investment forums where we bring business together with, with, with government and other partners to see how they can be able to mobilize investment for particular areas. So I think it's very important to do the analysis and the background work to identify those areas where people can come in. So that's part of the work um, that we do. But another thing that we also do is we really look at making sure that women's groups and also youth groups are involved in policy making. Because it's one thing to say we have all these opportunities uh, that are available, but if they're not at the table articulating what their barriers are and having these uh, reflected as part of the policy making process, then we'll again hit a roadblock. So we, we try to do that um, around identifying in, in, uh, investment opportunities. We try to also see how we can engage them at the decision making table to make sure that the key issues, like for example, uh, cross borders, women uh, cross border traders, uh, one stop border posts. We want to make sure that that becomes an instrument where the needs of women traders, for instance, working across borders are taken into account, whether it's security, whether it's simplifying the process of, of being able to export things, that is also one of the areas that we work in. So definitely identify the opportunities, connect you know, businesses to opportunities, but also make sure that the needs of the of the young entrepreneurs and the women ent entrepreneurs really feed into policy making. Wonderful. So investable opportunities, that's a big word right there. I think uh, that's where we need to start because if uh, the opportunities are not investable, there will be no attraction uh, for, you know, for the money uh, or the funding for those projects. Uh, you touched on SDGs, uh, which is Sustainable Development uh, Goals. Uh, there is a huge focus on uh, localization of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now we do have UCLGA, uh, the Association of Mayors. How do we start uh, focusing on those kind of opportunities, but working with local mayors and making local mayors um, champions? or maybe sponsors for some of those projects, uh, i.e., or for example, uh, creative industries. Uh, it's, I think it's something that uh, we can easily mobilize ourselves around. Um, women, we like fashion, but we are wearing African fashion, uh, but in a, you know, in a contemporary way. How, you know, how, where do we find those uh, opportunities within the creative industries. Material in Ghana, uh, it, it may not only be in Ghana, Nigeria, but we need to start from maybe one country. For instance, we start with Nigeria. And then, but we are, we are building a, a, a prototype that is scalable 
across the continent. Then we bring in technology. Now we are talking e-commerce. So someone is, is manufacturing their clothes. So I can go in on internet, on the application. I can order my, uh, my, my material, choose my, my style. It can be specific to me. It is done, it is shipped to me. Something to think about? Your thoughts? I think that's, that's definitely an area to think about because mm -hmm. we've been in discussion about, we have a big focus on empowering women and youth, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're also looking at how we recover from COVID because this is one of the, the hardest hit um, areas with a small scale informal sector, uh, not being able to you know, go out and, 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 and carry on with their, with their craft. So we're looking at it and saying, how do we create opportunities for people not to get back to where they were before COVID, right. but right. how can they recover even, you know, adapt and transform uh, yeah. beyond COVID? So the first place we've started is we're doing some analytical work, collecting um, perception, information, and, and so on and so forth, because we have to be clear about you know what what are what are the critical um, areas where support is required of course financing is required but one of the things that we are also learning is that they want platforms mm -hmm. right they have mm -hmm. ideas and they want platforms where they'll be able to pitch those ideas and connect with uh, not just financing but also people who are further ahead uh, than they are so that yeah. is one of the things we're thinking about how how can we make those platforms available so that we can have these young people with the bright ideas who can also now be empowered whether it's through uh, business training because not everybody knows how to run a business a good idea doesn't automatically translate into a business so that is something that we're trying to see how we can do this at scale so rather than trying to do it ourselves trying to, con to connect with people who are already doing this kind of, of business training mm -hmm. so that they can come up with, as you're saying, investable opportunities. So that by the time they go through uh, that kind of uh, support, then they can be able to have not just an idea, but a business plan that is fundable. So those are some of the things that we're trying to look at, how we can create those platforms to bring different players together because we're not the financiers. We're mm -hmm. not the ones who are doing the business training, but we can create that platform where we can have, we can identify um, these young people and these enterprises and then connect them to, to some of these services. So that's one of, one of the things that I think um, is, is useful going forward. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so creative industries, but there's also food, uh, to Shelley's point. Uh, I think those are the key areas. Um, why food uh, Africa, one of the key focus areas is feeding Africa. But when you talk about feeding Africa, we should not forget the sixth regional economic block, which is the Africa diaspora. Those who left, you know, years ago, 400 years ago, including those who left two years ago. Right, they are all part of the Africa diaspora. So I think uh, feeding the continent, how do we feed ourselves? Africa has got 60% um, of the global arable land or land for agriculture it is in Africa. So Africa can feed all the continents, uh, you know, Europe, it can feed China, all in Africa. So that's how big Africa is and the opportunities are there. So we can start with what we are familiar with as women. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about creative industries. And uh, let's, let's look for the opportunities in those areas. So uh, there is a question, a good question. And the question is, uh, yes, we'll be going to Africa. What about the travel industry, the opportunities within the travel industry? Uh, Sherry, your thoughts on that? Uh, we can't hear you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Head uh, muted. Yeah, yeah, there definitely are um, uh, lots of opportunities within the travel industry. And I'm not, I'm not going just to confine it to the travel industry, but to the whole tourism industry at mm -hmm. large. Uh, so the travel element becomes part of that tourism industry. There's the travel aspect, there's the hospitality aspect, Right now, uh, 
this um, the hotel concept is becoming less and less attractive to people. Just going and staying in a big hotel. People are liking, the, the, the trend is moving towards home away from home. So buying tracts of land and setting up pieces, um, um, units of uh, uh, accommodation, which can where people almost like lodges. Uh, and they can, the piece of land can be bought and mass by a group of people but the units can be owned by individuals. Those kinds of A and A, B and B type of ownerships, and they, you don't necessarily have to own the whole unit. The um, hospitality industry, one of the things that it has done very well, especially in South Africa, is to uh, almost like these um, uh, travel schemes where you buy a share ownership in, in a certain, big uh, area of uh, uh, hospitality. Though there are opportunities in that space again, because some of them, they've, they've run out of space. If you have to book, you book two years in advance. That shows you there is opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the travel itself, the travel, not only just the travel from one destination to another, but the inter-travel. I have landed in my tourist destination. How do I move around? What what there are opportunities? What uh, for for rethinking moving around of tourists within the country? Uh, yeah. I think Uber Uber has gone quite a, ahead, and there are a few competitors in that space. Um, so, but there there are always these opportunities to rethink convenience to rethink home away from home for, for the individual, and then to rethink security, because that's one of the things that uh, we are, must be considered. And a lot of women are not very much in the security space, security of the tourists, security at large, uh, security within the, the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, there's something that was uh, just come into my mind, and, um, but it's an important thing within, within tourism. It's something that is quite in demand. And, but um, thinking around those lines and then also just uh, supplying inputs to the hospitality sector, for example, linens. Uh, we, a lot of um, countries in Africa no longer produce those good quality linens. They are all imported. Uh, why can't we supply um, from the diaspora? The diaspora can supply. Uh, and those linens are available at a, at a reasonable, you, taking advantage of economies of scale. That's, that's right, what I'm, right, I'm just right. trying to drive it. Yeah. One, and one uh, then, I, I yeah. think we, we, we got that. I think you have touched a very important uh, point there uh, the quality of imports. Mm -hmm. um, some of uh, uh, will not say which countries they are coming from, uh, but the quality, uh, Africa has actually been having more like import uh, dumping, it uh, dumping, so to say. Uh, so the quality uh, of some of the products coming into, into the continent, not great. How do we start uh, creating our own uh, products with, uh, with the right quality? So it's a, it's a question, but I think uh, the, from the conversation, uh, that we have had today, there are some areas where we can start further exploring. Uh, that's uh, in the creative industry and in the agriculture food industry. Uh, looking at the whole agriculture you know, value chain, it can be from uh, farming. I can start doing farming from wherever I am. Uh, I can... Uh, I can buy goods wherever I am. We are going to talk about how do we enable that when we go through the digital economy uh, session. There are some interesting uh, discussions that we are going to have. So I would like to, uh, to open up uh, to any further questions. There is uh, someone who says they want to network with uh, bookshops. Um, I'm not sure bookshops, uh, whether they are not going to be a dinosaur already, because if we are talking about uh, e-bookshops, maybe yes, uh, but uh, you know the uh, brick and mortar bookshops, they are really dying down. Uh, so there is someone who's asking, um, so 
the question is if it is an e-bookshop, yes, I think uh, there are possibilities of connecting. Uh, something that uh, we can uh, look at. Uh, you can leave, please leave your email address and we'll get back to you on that. I'm going to open up to any further questions from, uh, from the floor. Are there any further questions? And please, we do have a Q&A uh, panel. If you have any questions, you can just type in your question. Whilst we are waiting for questions, um, I want to go back to Ghana. So um, creative industries, I'm in there. Uh, we are talking about um, uh, performing arts. We are talking about fashion. So we can start with those two areas. Uh, performing arts, uh, Zora Festival, they do a lot in that space. Uh, there's also the, um, the Harlem Week, uh, it's all about performing arts. Uh, the leader there for the Harlem Week, they are part of the door. They are actually the leaders in the performing arts. So it's an area that we can start working on. And how do we go back to Ghana, connecting with the mayor of Ghana through Mr. Mbasi uh, to start uh, working on performing arts uh, you know, session that we can uh, you know, further explore and working together with the uh, Harlem uh, Week uh, uh, leaders here. So that's point number one. Uh, point number two, the fashion. Uh, uh, let's identify where they are uh, in Ghana. Uh, you're already doing the work there, but also being mindful that uh, it's not only for Ghana, we are, it's a prototype uh, with a scale for Africa. So we are building for scale, uh, but we start from somewhere and we'll come back next year and we'll, we'll come and report back on the, on the progress. Um, and so the farming is also linked to uh, Sherry. Um, so we can work together on that. Um, so yeah, so you'll be the people who'll be leading us in that space, Sherry and, uh, and uh, my sister, Angela. Thank you so much. Let me see if there are any, any questions. I don't see any questions. Um, Let's have some uh, parting uh, remarks. Uh, Shelly, quickly, what are your closing remarks? And then Angela. Uh, my closing remarks is um, uh, let's, let's continue to follow up uh, on the discussions and, uh, um, and also to identify the key persons who can um, uh, within areas of interest within Africa. And also let's not forget a new space that has come up. Well, it's not like come up, but where, where awareness has become much more now is in mm -hmm. the mental health space. Uh, there's a lot of um, opportunities within education around mental health and around taking care of uh, needy children because the taboos and the cultural mindsets uh, of Africa never really used to bring this to the fore. But with the education, we see more and more of uh, Africans beginning to embrace uh, discussion and openness around those areas and uh, also mm -hmm. doing away with cultural taboos. So it's a huge area in terms of even the literature around it. There's not just enough information going around in local languages and in accessible formats so that people can, uh, can access it. But yes, let's continue to pursue opportunities in Africa abound. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Sherry. Uh, Angela? Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Zinzi. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to, to contribute to this discussion. I just want to leave with a few remarks about the huge potential that we have by looking at Africa as one single market rather than looking at a specific country. The, mm -hmm. Whether you invest in a particular country, you will be able to access so many other markets going on from the Africa continental free trade, trade area. So immense opportunities to invest in one place and then have access to, to so many other places. And, and really looking at that development angle of investing in trade. Uh, I, there are so many cultural festivals that are taking place across different countries. It would be good to see how we can create that platform to connect 
uh, what is going on, what is already going on. And I'm sure there, there are a lot of um, opportunities in Ghana as well, and I'm happy to, to be the bridge for that. And also just to invite people to be a different kind of tourist, be a cultural tourist, you know? There are so many opportunities to partner even with, with people on the continent and young people are coming up with such new ways of doing tourism. I saw an example of, of this young lady who went to Rwanda and stayed with a women's group and learned how to make banana beer, was on bicycles riding across, you know, different places, ended up on a raft in, you know. So there's so many opportunities to explore you know, tourism that adds value to communities and to people. And we'd be happy to, to engage in that space as well. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. That, that's a good point, uh, that kind of tourism. Someone in the chat, uh, they said they have homes uh, in Zimbabwe. So again, it doesn't have to be a hotel, you can find a home. So we can start our own Airbnb within our own network, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's another area <laughs> okay so that uh, takes us uh, to the end of this uh, very uh, interesting uh, panel thank you for deepening uh, the conversations uh, with your input thank you sherry thank you angela we are looking to angela as the bridge we are looking to sherry and angela to be able to lead us uh, in terms of uh, sustainable trade uh, going forward to be you know the leaders in that space uh, because of your experience and because we started the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, so in summary, we have all those uh, areas, uh, the two areas, the food industry, uh, the creative industry, those are the key areas that we are going to look at.